can stand up and try to make us look silly by saying, oh, there's a new government in Iraq and you guys didn't realize that. One, we did realize that, right? The reason why that it's not, why the point that he was trying to make there is not important is because the new government is also Shia, right? Which means that all of the problems that he was talking about in terms of the fact that a Shia government is one of the things that's caused the rise of ISIS is obviously irrelevant when you have a continuation of a Shia influence within that government. The next thing is that we think that the Iraqi government, as it stands, has shown that they are completely toothless and completely unable to fight ISIS as it currently stands. And that's why on our side of the house, we are proud to stand for an America that will stand up and help to bring about an end to the major crisis that we see unfolding at the moment. There are three things that I'm going to talk about in my speech today. The first one is the nature of this problem, why we think it's been mischaracterized by that side of the house and why we think they are excessively optimistic about the ability to deal with this in any other way. The next thing I want to take a look at is the idea we had from that side of the house that we think uh, that they think Iraq is going to, over time, simply evolve into an autonomous entity. Why it is that they have provided absolutely no compelling narrative for how it will ever happen. And on our side of the house, we've given you instead a very compelling narrative for how we can bring about not an autonomous entity, but instead something that is a lot more peaceful and a lot more plausible. Finally, I want to take a look at why um, we think there is a major responsibility to intervene here um, and the principal justification that we're standing for on this side of the house. So to begin with, Malena told you very clearly at the beginning of this debate that it is not viable to rely on the Peshmerga, right? She told you that there are, ni there are only 90,000 um, troops there, and it is absolutely false and like just a factual lie, which I can refute no other way, to when they stand up and say that there are double that number, right? Even if there are double that number, that is still like not an adequate number of troops to deal with a 6,000 mile border, which is what they're currently having to defend. Moreover, though, what we told you is that even, like, regardless of the number, they're also not particularly well trained, right? Why is that important? It's important because even if it means that sometimes they can, like, take back some areas using the amount of force that they do have, they don't necessarily have, like, the kind of strategic military capability to upscale into, like, a more, um, into, like, a more strategic or a more widespread, um, fight for, no thank you, um, for their areas. The other thing though is that we think it's incredibly problematic <coughs> that their solution to deal with this, which relies on the Peshmerga, is simply to continue to pour arms into this kind of situation, right? We think that when you have huge ethnic tensions that are not going away anytime soon, and when you have like massive amounts of militarism already, we think that it's really bad to just like keep getting more and more arms floating around in the hands of the kinds of organizations that you're talking about instead of organizations like the United States military, who we think are like a little bit better and a little bit um, and a little bit more trustworthy in the way that they're gonna hang on to those things. No, thank you. The final thing, um, Sorry, the final thing though is that we think that a lot of those points are kind of conceded by that side of the house when they say that they're willing to, that they say that they're willing to and they agree that it's necessary to go in and to use drone strikes and to continue these kinds of targeted strikes, right? The fact that they want to do anything at all like that concedes the fact that the Peshmerga cannot on their own be relied on to do, the, um, to do this kind of thing. So we think it's bizarre that they've rested so much of their case on relying on them. No, thank you. The next thing that we want to tell, um, the next thing moreover though, so that's why we think that like, the nature of Peshmerga is such that we cannot rely on them. Moreover though, what we think is that in terms of the nature of ISIS, those guys have massively underestimated them in a number of ways, right? We told you that they're incredibly good at hiding and incredibly good at urban warfare. The reason for that is that they've been training for years in Syria, right? They're really good at hiding from airstrikes because that's what you have to do all the time in Syria, right? They do stuff like hiding their, like they have a whole lot of practices related to the way they like hide Humvees in garages and stuff like that. We think that that's the reason why you absolutely have to have boots on the ground that are flushing these organizations out into the open. Yes, obviously it's going to be regrettable if they're like, sorry, obviously we're not necessarily going to be like invading Syria as well and therefore we can't on our side of the house take on the burden of entirely decimating ISIS in its entirety, but we think if we can completely flush it out of Iraq, if we can get it back over the border so that it's only in Syria, we can start to rebuild an Iraq that is a lot more stable um, in the long term and we're really um, proud to stand by that. No, thank you. What I want to move on to now is the idea of <laughs> the idea that this side of the house put forward of Iraq just kind of organically evolving into an autonomous entity, which is apparently what they think is going to happen if we just leave the status quo to play out. 
Here's the reasons why we don't think that's a very plausible narrative. I'll take you in a minute. Firstly, it's because we think power sharing has consistently failed, right? And there are very obvious reasons for that. <coughs> the main one being that there is absolutely no trust, and nor should there necessarily be that much trust, between the different parties who are involved in this conflict. So the fact that Sunnis have been consistently screwed over by Malaki, the fact that Shias have been consistently screwed over by Hussein, the fact that Kurds have been consistently screwed over by everyone, means that there is absolutely no reason why those parties are necessary, uh, like ever going to buy in to the, um, to the kind of trust that is necessary to make power sharing work. And the, that kind of power sharing is what brings around the peace that eventually lets like nation building happen, right? We think that when you can't get that first step, you're never gonna get the um, like evolving national identity that that side of the house would like to see happen. Yes? Okay, so the last time the USA tried to engage with people who were very good guerrilla fighters was in Vietnam, right? And they were there for over a decade and still couldn't defeat them and had to stay there for 10 years and have all of the arms that come with that. Why do you think that's not going to happen here? Well, for a whole variety of reasons, right? The first one being that like military strategy and military technology has come a really long way since then, right? Is it Moreover, like when you when you look at the kinds of organizations we're dealing with, when you look at the fact that the U.S. is like engaged in a whole lot of areas in this part of the world, we think that the like strategies that they're able to employ, yeah, obviously it's a difficult task, right? But we think the fact that it's such a difficult task is the very reason why you can't rely on like ninety thousand cash merchants to do it all for you. It's yeah, obviously difficult on both sides of the house. Moreover, though, what we think if we take a look at how best we start to try to overcome the lack of trust. Um, that we see between these parties that's going to bring about um, a kind, the kind of long, longer lasting peace that that side of the house want to see. We think the beauty of our solution, right, is that you don't need to wait for the evolution of that coherent and like national identity, right? You don't need to wait for Iraq to become an autonomous entity. You accept the fact that it's never going to be one and that it's like just a quirk of the arbitrariness of map drawing and history that it is one at the moment. And instead you say we should draw borders that like better align with national identities and in doing so we are able to facilitate all of the things that need to happen in terms of um, in terms of the kinds of peace agreements that Malena talked to you about. We think that a United States that is able to take a strong stance in Iraq now and that is then able to back um, to back independent states is one that is going to be a force for peace in the region, in the world, and we're really proud to propose.